Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. That concludes general questions. And it is now time to move on to First Minister's questions. And at question number one, I call Douglas Ross. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Figures released yesterday show that one in every ten ambulances in Scotland sat outside hospitals for hours waiting for patients to be admitted. That means in just one week, 700 ambulances across the country were stuck outside hospital for hours. We have heard of reports of ambulances backing up, waiting outside Aberdeen Royal Infirmary, Edinburgh Royal Infirmary, Ayrshire's Cross House Hospital and many more. So, Deputy First Minister, why are ambulances backed up for hours outside hospitals in Scotland? Deputy First Minister. Uh, just before I answer uh, Douglas Ross's question, I want to begin by putting on record this Government's thanks and very best wishes to Mark Drakeford as he steps down as First Minister of Wales and pay tribute to his dedication in many years of public service. And despite our differences on the Constitution, Mark Drakeford has been a friend and ally to Scotland throughout his time as First Minister. He's never shied away from defending devolution and, of course, standing against the devastating effect of Brexit and Tory cuts and working with others to improve cross-government cooperation. Yep. And I wish him all the best for the future. The important question on the Scottish Ambulance Service, which of course continues to experience challenges with uh, waiting times uh, for ambulances in a number of hospital sites across uh, Scotland, and of course, as Douglas Ross uh, spoke about, some uh, are taking uh, longer than they should uh, to turn around at the front door of our hospital. Of course, uh, similar pressures are being felt throughout the UK as we enter into uh, winter pressures. Patient safety remains our top priority and of course I would apologise to anyone uh, who has uh, either experienced any waits for an ambulance to reach them or indeed has had to uh, wait uh, at uh, too long uh, in A&E. I want to also thank our staff who of course are working extremely hard to maintain a, a fast uh, response to our most critically unwell uh, patients. Uh, Scottish Ambulance Service is working hard with health boards to minimise delays and handover times. And of course, as part of the funding for the winter plan, the Scottish Ambulance Service has received an additional £50 million to help address thank you, the increased Cabinet demand Secretary, for thank their you. services going into to winter. Question number two from Douglas Ross. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And I uh, also wish Mark Drakeford well. I'm sure he's pleased that a uh, mention from the SNP is a positive one, because it's normally a critical one when it suits the SNP's uh, argument. But Shona Robeson was mentioning there uh, that some of... Well, you know... <laughs> Members, true. let's hear it's, Mr Ross. It's true. Members! It's interesting. They don't like to hear it, but they use it every week. Mr. Ross, please ask your question. Thank you. Uh, the Welsh Assembly. Uh, but anyway, the Deputy First Minister was mentioning that some of the waiting times are longer than they should be. So we've done a, an FOI request, and I've got the response here on ambulance waiting times across Scotland. They show some of the worst turnaround times on record. We can reveal that an ambulance was waiting outside a hospital in Ayrshire for 15 hours. Another waited over 10 hours in Grampian and in the Lothian Health Board area waited over 11 hours. This government has known about the problem for years. So why does this scandalous situation keep on happening? Deputy First Minister. Well, as the Cabinet Secretary for Health said earlier on, uh, of course, we are, uh, as part of the winter plan, uh, in funding the Scottish Ambulance Service with an additional £50 million to help address the increased demand for the services going into winter. In addition to that, we are, of course, investing in hospital at home at £12 million to increase capacity to help to keep people away uh, from the front door of our hospitals. The Cabinet Secretary earlier on talked about the, the action being taken at various health board areas, including Grampian, who, of course, uh, are getting uh, their share of the hospital at home capacity and are working hard to address some of the issues that Douglas uh, Ross uh, alluded to. Can I just say one thing, though? Um, the investment that I mentioned, the £50 million uh, to address the increased demand for the services that have been given to the Scottish Ambulance Service, that is uh, nearly five times the amount of money that the UK Tory government is giving for health 
in its entirety for the budget next year. So we will continue to address some of the very serious concerns here and the Cabinet Secretary for Health had the annual review with the Scottish Ambulance Service yesterday where many of these issues were addressed. But it does, it's a bit rich for Douglas Ross to come to this chamber talking about the performance of our Scottish Ambulance Service or indeed our health service more generally when they have singularly Thank you, failed Secretary. to provide Thank any you, funding Secretary. for our health service. Douglas Ross. That, that's just not true. I don't know how many times the Deputy First Minister is going to come to this Parliament and make statements that are incorrect. But she referenced what the Cabinet Secretary mentioned earlier in response to Douglas Lumsden on ambulance waiting times. And the Cabinet Secretary mentioned something that the Deputy First Minister didn't. He mentioned the challenge of delayed discharge. And I wonder why Shona Robeson didn't want to mention delayed discharge in her answer. Could it be that when she was Health Secretary eight years ago, she promised to eradicate delayed discharge completely. That is a consequence of her failure and the government's failure to deliver on that pledge. Now, our FOI has also unco uncovered some shocking ambulance response times. Purple calls involve the most life-threatening, dangerous situation for patients. Half of the patients in that category have had a cardiac arrest, and these calls have a target response time of six minutes. Yet our FOI request reveals that some patients are waiting more than half an hour and others are waiting 10 times longer than the target. So Deputy First Minister, why should anyone whose heart has stopped be waiting so long for an ambulance to arrive? Deputy First Minister. Well, first of all, on delayed discharge, uh, I absolutely recognise the impact of delayed discharge, which is why, of course, the Cabinet Secretary for Health is working very closely with uh, local authorities and health boards in order to address the impact that delayed uh, discharge has. Uh, on, in terms of the, the, the point that Douglas Ross made around those most urgent uh, category calls, uh, it is absolutely important that those calls are responded to as quickly as possible. And of course, in, the, in most cases they are, but I accept, as I set out at the beginning, it is not acceptable if someone is waiting uh, too long for uh, those uh, calls. The median response for purple calls uh, was, uh, in the, the performance information uh, with the week ending uh, 10th of December, the median response for purple calls was 7 minutes 32 seconds and for red 9 minutes 25 seconds. I accept that is too long and I accept there will be people waiting outside of those uh, times. What I will say though is that the investment that has been made in our Scottish Ambulance Service and in our Health Service is absolutely not down to any of the resources that are being given to us by the UK Government. Douglas Ross said earlier on about the investment in public services. I have it in black and white that next year all the, um, inf the money that is coming from the UK Government for health amounts to £10.8 million. That is enough for five hours capacity in the NHS. And actually, it was only for smoking cessation. Thank it you, Deputy First Minister. For frontline services. Douglas Ross. So I don't think Douglas Ross Douglas should come Ross. and lecture us here. I call about Douglas the Ross. Service. The UK Government has provided the biggest ever block grant to the Scottish Government to deliver for public services here in Scotland and it's a failure by the SNP Government and the SNP Ministers that is having an impact on patients. The Deputy First Minister speaks about them waiting a few minutes longer than the target. Some are waiting over an hour for a purple category call. That is unacceptable. And this isn't just impacting the patients. This morning, I spoke to a paramedic who wishes to remain anonymous. He told us staff morale is at an all-time low. He described waiting in ambulances for more than five hours some days with unwell patients in freezing temperatures. He said paramedics want to do more for their patients, but staff are considering leaving because the situation is unsustainable. He said the Scottish Government's latest funding programme was supposed to ensure the right resources in the right place at the right time, but he wants to know how that can possibly be effective when he and his colleagues are sitting outside hospitals unable to get in. 
Systematic, and systematic problems are preventing frontline staff from giving patients the treatment they deserve. So what does the Deputy First Minister have to say to disillusioned NHS staff about this crisis? Deputy First Minister. Well, we take the views of our frontline staff uh, very seriously indeed. And of course, that's one of the reasons that the Cabinet Secretary for Health, uh, when uh, he is doing the annual reviews, uh, usually, as, as when I was Health Secretary, we meet yeah, the frontline yeah. staff and hear their views, as he did uh, yesterday with the Scottish Ambulance Service. What I can say to Douglas Ross is that Scottish Ambulance Service staffing is up 50 per cent under this government. Uh, and we have record levels of investment in our health service, including in our Scottish Ambulance Service. That is in stark contrast to the real terms cut that the UK Tory government is giving the Department of Health in England, a real terms cut. And that, of course, flows through, flows through to the resources that this government has available for our health service if we were to follow the Tory choices. 10.8 million for our health service. Well, we, of course, will not follow UK Tory spending plans and we will make sure we protect our health service and our Scottish Ambulance Service going forward. At question number two, I call Anna Summer. Thank you, Deputy Minister. Can I start by thanking the Deputy First Minister for her kind words about Mark Drakeford, who helped shape devolution over the last 25 years and has been a dedicated servant to the people of Wales. President Officer, we also send our condolences to the family of Hanzala Malik. He served the people of Glasgow for over 25 years as a Labour councillor and as an MSP. He was a champion for equality and he had friends right across the political spectrum. Deputy President, officer, people across the country are preparing for Christmas. It is a special time, but for many it comes at the end of a year filled with anxiety about their family finances. Over the past year, we have seen a 30% increase in the number of families at risk of losing the homes they own and being made homeless. Now, that is a direct result of a mortgage crisis caused by Tory economic chaos. But the Scottish Government has a mortgage support scheme, but it seems in name only because in reality it has not supported anyone since 2015 and the Scottish Government has committed to a review by the end of the financial year but that's in April when people are losing their homes right now. So why won't the Government stop the delay and support families before they lose their homes? Deputy First Minister. Well, can I first of all echo Anna Sarwar's comments about the sad and sudden news of Hanzala Malik's death. He was a, a true champion of his Glasgow community and our thoughts are with his family and uh, his many friends. Um, can I also uh, agree with Anna Sawar that many families are experiencing uh, real pressure, not just at Christmas but have throughout the year as the, the Tory uh, caused cost of living crisis continues uh, to bite and affect their household finances. And of course it was due to the economic uh, catastrophe of Liz Truss's mini-budget that has caused many of those mortgages to be sky-high due to increased interest rates. In terms of our support, um, over the last year, of course, we uh, spent around £3 billion of Scottish Government resources in supporting household budgets, the main one being, of course, our investment in Scottish Child Payment. And of course, we will continue through our welfare funds and other measures, discretionary housing payments, to try to support household budgets going forward. In terms of those uh, supports for people with mortgages specifically, um, we will continue to look at what more we can do. And I'm happy to update Anna Sawar in due course about that. Anna Sawar. Thank you, Deputy Secretary Officer. The government has a mortgage support scheme People are losing their homes right now and being forced to go homeless and the government is going to continue to look at how it's going to implement that mortgage support scheme. What is the point of having the scheme if it's not going to support people right now when they're in such difficulty? Because every family that loses their home risks joining the almost 30,000 families who are currently homeless in Scotland. Over 15,000 families across the country are staying in temporary accommodation right now many of them in hostels, B&Bs and hotel rooms. And shockingly, that means 9,500 children will wake up on Christmas morning without a home to call their own. On average, families with children 
spend 347 days in temporary accommodation. That's almost a year. In some places, that is even higher. In Glasgow, it is 381 days. In Midlothian, it's 483 days. And here in Edinburgh, it is 611 days. That is 20 months homeless and living in temporary accommodation. So, Deputy First Minister, aren't you ashamed of that figure? And how have you allowed it to get this bad? Deputy First Minister. Oh, let me come on to the issue of, of the important issue of temporary accommodation uh, in a moment. Um, we are supporting household incomes beyond actually many of the areas that we have devolved competence for. That £3 billion pounds that I mentioned earlier on, of course, seeks to address things like the bedroom tax, which uh, I'm not sure if uh, Anna Sawar's uh, Westminster party have uh, decided that they will uh, get rid of the bedroom tax. But these are pressures, these are pressures that come on the Scottish budget for things that we have to mitigate. And I'm going to be honest, we cannot mitigate everything because we don't have the resources to do so. But on the important issue of temporary accommodation, we are committed and are acting on the recommendations of the expert temporary accommodation task and finish group, which of course was co-chaired with uh, Shelter. And we're investing at least £60 million this year through the Affordable Housing Supply Programme to support a national acquisition plan. We're working with social landlords to deliver a new programme of stock management and we're implementing targeted plans with local authorities facing the greatest pressure backed by additional resources. And of course, a transition to rapid rehousing is the best way to reduce the use of temporary accommodation in the longer term. And we remain wholly committed to rapid rehousing and future budgets, of course, will be set out next week, which will confirm that. Anna Sauer. It's frankly a shocking answer after 16 years of an SNP government and there are people sleeping rough in our streets across the country. We have a housing emergency in Scotland, something that this SNP government fails to recognise. 30,000 homeless households in our country and that's the answer we get. 15,000 families in temporary accommodation, 9,500 children without a home, some in hostels, B&Bs and hotels. 110,000 families on a housing waiting list. A child being homeless in Scotland every 45 seconds. We desperately need more homes, but this SNP government cut the housing budget by more than a quarter, and now new housing starts are down 24%. This government's incompetence has consequences. Now, they might not want to hear my word for it, but this is what Alison Watson, Director of Shelter Scotland, says about the effect of the SNP's choices. It means that an already devastating housing emergency will get worse and continue to devastate lives. So, Deputy First Minister, how many more families need to be made homeless before this SNP government takes responsibility for the crisis they have created? Deputy First Minister. So, we are uh, taking action. Of course, that's why we have a housing uh, plan of £3.5 billion of investment over the course of this Parliament to deliver 110,000 more homes by 2032. It's why, of course, we have in Scotland the strongest rights across the UK nations for people experiencing homeless. And it's why, of course, we're taking the action that I laid out on, uh, on tackling temporary uh, accommodation. And we know, of course, that one of the pressures on temporary accommodation is the Home Office's fast-track asylum process, which is placing, of course, Glasgow City Council in particular yeah. under unprecedented pressure and risk uh, pushing people into destitution. So we will continue to invest in housing and invest in tackling homelessness. What would be good to hear, though, from the Labour Party is whether Rachel Reeves is to be believed when she is saying that there's going to be no additional funding for public services and that we should lower our expectations that anything will change from the terrible uh, resource settlement that we've had from this Tory government. So we'll wait and see, because I would welcome any commitment to housing investment made by Rachel Reeves or any other Labour spokesperson. I might wait a long time, though, presiding officer. Question number three, Liz Smith. To ask the Deputy First Minister whether the Scottish Government will commit to any reform of Scotland's planning regulations in order to generate growth as recommended by CBI Scotland on the 7th of December. Deputy First Minister. So planning is uh, crucial for delivering the development and infrastructure that we will need to achieve a, a fairer and green, greener economy. We have already 
made significant progress in planning reform, including the adoption of National Planning Framework 4 and a new system of local development planning earlier this year. Our reforms are now focusing on working with industry and local authorities to ensure the new system does all it can to support the delivery of good quality development. As a priority, we are preparing to publish a consultation early next year on opportunities for improving resources and planning authorities. Ms. Smith. Uh, thank you. The First Minister was at COP28 uh, last week promoting Scotland's green leadership potential. But the Deputy First Minister will know that the average offshore wind project in Scotland still takes around 12 years to deliver. And she knows too that there are substantial concerns amongst business and industry about the complexity of Scotland's current planning regulations and the lengthy delays for consenting processes. So can I ask what the Scottish Government is doing to speed up the timescales for these critical projects in order to unlock billions of pounds of investment that will stimulate the economic growth that Scotland so desperately needs? Deputy First Minister. Uh, well, can I say to, to Liz Smith that we, of course, have uh, got a very clear plan around cutting consenting at times for onshore uh, wind developments, and we are looking at what more can be done around uh, offshore uh, developments, because these are absolutely crucial for uh, Scotland's economy going forward. I uh, met with uh, CBI last week, I think it was, um, where they raised some of these issues around uh, planning uh, consents, and uh, we agreed to uh, continue to discuss what ways might be found uh, in partnership uh, with businesses and others to uh, work on proposals that could help to address some of these uh, issues, and we'll continue to do that. And supplementary, Daniel Johnson. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. It is striking when you have conversations with business, regardless of sector, regardless of type, the fact that the discussion inevitably comes back to planning. That's particularly true in renewables, whereas Liz Smith points out they will highlight the length of time ranging from seven to 12 years. By comparison, the same projects, they state, will take as little as two years to get through the planning consenting regime in places such as Norway. So is the Scottish Government looking at international best practice and will it seek to benchmark our planning processes against our key competitors uh, in the renewables space? Deputy First Minister. Yes, I can say to Daniel Johnson, of course, uh, we will continue to uh, look at that and look at where there's best practice uh, internationally. I, I think that is the right thing to do. Daniel Johnson will appreciate some of the complexities around uh, many of these applications, and that's why, of course, some of them uh, take uh, too long. Uh, there is uh, an issue about capacity within the planning system, and that's what we're looking to address. That was really the question that uh, Liz Smith uh, was alluding to, and th those were the issues uh, that were raised uh, in my meetings with businesses also. So we'll continue to look at how we can make progress, and I'll be happy to make sure the Chamber is updated as we do so. Question number four, Kevin Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer. To ask the Deputy First Minister what action the Scottish Government is taking to grow the green economy. Deputy First Minister. The global transition to net zero offers enormous economic opportunities. Scotland has strengths and potential in sectors ranging from wind, hydrogen, renewable heat and advanced manufacturing to data and financial services. Our green industrial strategy will set out how we will support businesses and investors to have confidence to make decisions and invest in Scotland and realise these economic opportunities. The green industrial strategy complements our sectoral just transition plans, which focus on securing a fair transition to net zero for specific high emitting sectors of the economy. Kevin Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer. The PwC Green Jobs Barometer report uh, published this week found Scotland to be one of only two areas to record an increase in green job adverts from 22 to 23, while the UK as a whole saw a 29% decrease. The number of green employment opportunities in Scotland will increase, but what concerns does the Deputy First Minister have regarding the recent illogical Tory net zero U-turns and the harm that this will have on Scotland's future energy jobs growth? 
Deputy First Minister. Can I uh, join uh, Kevin Stewart in welcoming the positive findings of the Jobs uh, Barometer? It shows that Scotland is already leading the way in delivering a, a green jobs revolution and unlocking the tremendous potential uh, that our energy transition uh, has. This government stands squarely behind uh, businesses and investors who are realising the opportunities of green growth in Scotland, and we share uh, an ambition uh, to build a green, fair and growing economy. My only regret is that we continue to be constrained by the current fiscal settlement and, of course, the policies of this UK government. And the recent autumn statement, of course, delivers a worst-case scenario for Scotland with a real terms cut to our capital budget, undermining our ability to invest in Scotland's renewable future. But the message is, of course, that Scotland is open for business and we welcome investment. Absolutely. Supplementary, Maurice Golden. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. Last December, I highlighted the fact that Scotland's circular economy was just 1.3% circular, the worst which was surveyed. The former Net Zero Secretary assured me urgent action was being taken that would, and I quote, drive forward change in the years ahead. So 12 months on from that promise, can the Deputy First Minister update the Chamber? Is Scotland's economy now more than 1.3% circular? Deputy First Minister. Well, of course, the Minister will bring forward the Circular Economy Bill in the new year, which will help to address and make sure that the circular economy opportunities are, um, are gathered as, as much as they can within, of course, an environment where uh, Maurice Golden's uh, government is standing in absolutely the opposite direction than we need them to do. And those policies yeah. impact on uh, our ability to attract investment here because international investors will hear a very different message from the UK uh, government on renewable opportunities. So I think that is very uh, concerning uh, indeed. And hopefully with Maurice Golden's comments, um, I'm sure uh, we can be assured of his support for the Circular Economy Bill when it comes here in the new year. And supplementary, Maggie Chapman. Thank you. We know that connectivity is vital to securing and sustaining resilient green, local and regional economies. The campaign for North East Rail's Connect Our Coast plans and other public transport infrastructure will be crucial to ensure regeneration and community well-being, as well as reducing carbon emissions. Can the Deputy First Minister provide an update on strategic support and planning for transport infrastructure to support the green economy, especially in the North East? Deputy First Minister. Uh, well, can I say to uh, Maggie Chapman, she raises some important issues and what I'll do is make sure that the Minister uh, writes to her with an update uh, as quickly as possible. Question number five, Rosa Grant. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to a recent report by Highland Council which reportedly warns of a significant risk of parts of its region being drained of people. Deputy First Minister. Well, I welcome strong local leadership in responding to this complex and varied challenge, including this report from Highland Council. Our forthcoming Addressing Depopulation Action Plan has been developed following extensive engagement with local authorities, COSLA and regional partners. It will establish a new programme of work to be taken forward alongside local and regional partners to ensure sustainable communities, economies and public services. Rosa Grant. Homes are needed to retain populations, yet the government's promised priority for rural housing also includes commuter towns. The Council's report tells us that the cost of building a standard two- or three-bedroomed property in Highland exceeds £400,000. The government grant for council house building is less than £98,000. Depopulation leads to service breakdown. In many rural areas, there are no available home care for elderly people. Does the Deputy First Minister agree that this government's intervention has been totally inadequate to date and will she now act to save these communities? Deputy First Minister. Well, I, I, I don't accept uh, that analysis. What I do accept is that there are challenges uh, within uh, rural communities, whether it's on uh, rural housing, which of course is why we've brought forward the Rural and Islands Housing Action Plan, because we know that part of the solution is ensuring that people can remain living within rural communities and indeed that there is housing there for people to move to uh, when they take up opportunities uh, to, uh, to work. And that's why, of course, we're providing up to £25 million from the affordable housing budget over the next five years to support 
support housing for key workers. Uh, the, the member mentioned uh, the care sector, and of course that is one of the key sectors that we would want that uh, funding to support. So we recognise all of these issues, which is why, of course, uh, I'm committed, I'm working with Mary Goujon with the Rural uh, Delivery Plan to bring all of these areas from across government into one place and give renewed focus to making sure that we have coherence and focus in delivering for rural Scotland. Supplementary, Edward Mountain. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, last year, less than 5% of Caithness mums gave birth in Caithness. Over 200 had to travel to Inverness. Highland councillors are likely to declare a school's emergency because schools like Charleston Academy are collapsing. The government has ignored spending money in the Highlands on capital infrastructure. This catastrophic lack of funding is the real reason why there is a population drain. Surely it's time for this government to invest in the Highlands and start by duelling the A9 right now. Deputy First Minister. Of course, what Edward Mountain didn't mention was the new National Treatment Centre in Inverness, the new uh, hospital in Broadford, uh, and of course we will set out our plans for the A9 as uh, the Minister for Parliamentary Business has set out. But, you know, Edward Mountain comes here demanding more investment in infrastructure at the same time as his Tory government yeah. is cutting cutting capital investment by 10% over the next five years. How does Edward Mountain think that by cutting capital budgets by 10% that that's going to deliver on the capital projects that he is demanding for the Highlands? I think we need a bit of an answer to that from Edward Mountain and his Tory colleagues. Supplementary, Ivan McKee. Thank you, President Officer. Would the Deputy First Minister join with me in calling out the hypocrisy of the Labour Party who raised the issue of depopulation while supporting Brexit, aligning with the Tories and supporting restrictions on immigration, and failing to join with the SNP in calling for the devolution of immigration powers so Scotland can take all the necessary actions to address depopulation? And, um, Deputy First Minister, to respond as regards the matters within the government's jurisdiction? Yeah, well, of course, I do absolutely agree that the hypocrisy from the Labour Party is breathtaking. Uh, of course, the, the Labour Party that is now supporting the Brexit uh, plans that have de helped to ensure that our industries across the Highlands are struggling to recruit workers and has had a devastating impact on our economy. And, of course, uh, that the devastating impact is also in the face of us not having the power over migration measures that we would want to have in order to help yeah. with some of these depopulation issues. We have um, su suggested, for example, a rural visa pilot yeah. that has cross-party support across this chamber. But uh, the intransigence and, uh, of the UK Tory government that will not listen even to the most modest of suggestions, I think just... Uh, basically um, says all there is to say about the parties here not really caring about rural Scotland at all. Question number six, Gillian Mackay. To ask the Deputy First Minister what assessment the Scottish Government has made of the social benefit of extending free bus travel to all under 22s. Deputy First Minister. Well, I'm very uh, happy to see that over 100 million journeys have now uh, been made by under-22s across Scotland. Uh, this is a scheme that is making a real positive difference to the lives of our young people and their families. Just today, the year one evaluation of the Young Persons Free Bus Travel Scheme was published, showing positive progress in embedding sustainable travel behaviour in young people, opening up new social, education, leisure and educational opportunities, and reducing household costs to help children, particularly those living in poverty. Gillian uh, Mackay. I thank the Deputy First Minister for that answer. When Scottish Green MSPs first secured government support for free bus travel for young people in 2020, we did so because we believed that it would have a transformative impact. The first evaluation report published today makes clear that these benefits are now real. It's opening up our country for young people accessing leisure, work, education and support. And it's making a difference for young people, especially young women, travelling safely at night and helping to develop an affinity with bus travel that will last a lifetime. So can I ask the Deputy First Minister what more the Scottish Government can do to ensure that even more young people are able to secure those same benefits? Deputy First Minister. 
Well, as uh, Gillian Mackay points out, the evaluation is showing increased numbers of young people travelling by bus. Over a third of cardholders surveyed accessing new opportunities, and many families are reporting cost savings and reduced worry and anxiety about travel. The point Gillian Mackay also makes about young women is a, a very, very important point in being able to travel safely at night. So we will continue to look at what more can be done uh, in this area and happy to work with Gillian Mackay and others as we take that forward. We will now move to constituency and general questions. I call Colette Stevenson. Presiding officer, the UK government has just announced the closure of its Foreign, Commonwealth and Development Office in East Kilbride. Following a hard-fought campaign by local workers and their trade unions, we managed to keep HMRC in the town, so it beggars belief that the UK government will instead remove 1,000 jobs from my constituency by relocating another department. Local staff are worried about this decision, a hammer blow to East Kilbride that could cost the town's economy £30 million, according to the UK government's own figures. Does the Deputy First Minister agree with me that this is another broken promise to my constituents from the 2014 referendum campaign? And can she set out the Scottish Government's reaction to this announcement from the department headed by the unelected Tory, Tory Foreign Secretary, Lord Cameron? Deputy First Minister. Well, I know that many FCDO, I know that many FCDO staff. Well, um, I, I think it's appalling that the Tories. Find um, Deputy First Minister, please assume your seat. Members, I will not have all this mm. argument across the chamber from secretary positions. It is discourteous to the person who has the floor. The person who has the floor is the Deputy First Minister, and we must hear her response. Deputy First Minister. Well, I think the people of East Kilbride will draw their own conclusions when they hear the Tories laughing about the loss of a thousand jobs in our. I know that many FCDO staff living and working in East Kilbride will be shocked and concerned by the decision to close the office at Abercrombie House and by the disappointing way that the UK Government chose to announce uh, the news. Of course, the, the former Foreign Secretary also promised 500 more civil service jobs at uh, the FCDO in East Kilbride by 2025. So it is disappointing that the UK Government is now reneging on that promise to boost uh, the local economy. Uh, so we'll uh, con con continue to seek clarity from the UK government and assurances that there will be no compulsory redundancies as a result of this decision. But it is very disappointing for the people of East Kilbride. I call Jamie Halcrow Johnson, who is joining us online. Mr. Halcrow Johnson. Thank you. Um, a motion in front of Highland Council today from my Conservative colleague, Councillor Helen Crawford, highlights the poor state of many Highland schools. If passed, it will declare a school state a state emergency in Highland call for extra resources from the Scottish Government to urgently address some of the problems and would invite the Education Secretary to come before Highland Council to listen to concerns over funding shortfalls. So can I ask the Deputy First Minister and Finance Secretary, does she recognise the serious situation in Highland schools and the impacts it's having on pupils, parents and staff? And how will her SNP Government respond if a school state emergency is declared in SNP-led Highland today? Deputy First Minister. Well, in addition to getting, I'll ask the, the Education Secretary to write to Jamie Halcrow uh, Johnson, but I can uh, tell the member that through phase one uh, of the, the two billion uh, learning estate investment programme, the Scottish Government uh, awarded the Highland Council with funding of nearly uh, 37 million towards their 10, uh, 3 to 18 campus project through phase two. Uh, providing the Council with significant funding uh, for uh, Broadford Primary School and Nairn Academy, Academy projects. Um, and of course, in addition, through the previous 1.8 billion Scotland Schools for Future programme, we awarded the Council with funding of over 63 million uh, towards five school projects. I guess I would make the point I've made to other uh, Tory members during this session of FMQs that if Tory members really care about investment in our infrastructure, why are they allowing their UK Tory government to cut our capital budgets yeah. by 10% over the next five years? Perhaps they should have a word. Yeah. Colin I call Colleen McNeill. It was reported this week that Police Scotland are facing a surge in mental health calls, one in six to be exact. I'm sure the Deputy First Minister will agree with me that the police do an amazing job and often deal with people at their lowest point. 
But many officers feel they're filling a gap in health and social care. I even heard that officers on shift last week changed shift they waited that long in accident and emergency. Her Majesty's Inspector report states that there are better ways of getting people to the service rather than police officers staying for long periods of time. So I ask the Deputy First Minister, what action is the Scottish Government taking to address police officers' time? And does she agree this simply cannot continue? Deputy First Minister. I have a lot of uh, sympathy for the point that Polly McNeill is making. And there has been a lot of work on frontline services and trying to find ways of utilising the resources of our health service and our police service uh, in a way that um, is uh, more joined up. So, for example, uh, I was aware of a, a, a pilot um, previously in my own area uh, where you had uh, nurses, mental health nurses and police officers working together to attend uh, calls. So this is a, a very serious issue. I think it's an issue that there is more to be done in the reform space of the way our, uh, those services work together. And that is something that I'm determined to see a progress made on. So happy to keep Polly McNeill updated uh, on the progress that we can make in making sure that we support our health service and indeed our police service to respond to calls in the most appropriate way. Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Institute of Fiscal Studies and Office for Budget Responsibility told the Finance and Public Administration Committee on Tuesday that interest on the UK's £2.6 trillion debt will be £22 billion higher this year than forecast in March. It will now reach £116 billion, equating to six times Scotland's NHS annual budget, or £318 million of taxpayers' money per day. Can the Deputy First Minister explain what the impact will be on public services in Scotland next year, given the UK's need to service its growing mountain of debt? Deputy First Minister. Well, it was an excoriating analysis of the UK government budget by the IFS at the Finance Committee this week. Eye-watering that um, £318 million of taxpayers' money every day is going to service that debt of £116 billion. That's nearly six times more than Scot the Scot Scottish NHS budget uh, in its entirety. So this is yet due to another example of Tory economic incompetence that will impact on Scotland's budget. And that is why it's important that the IFS and others give an absolutely stark picture of what the impact will be of UK Tory incompetence on Scotland's budgets going forward. I call Oliver Mundell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Deputy First Minister, South of Scotland Enterprise have recently acquired land at Chapel Cross near Annan, and there has been a strong expression of interest from Reblade, a Scottish-based company who recycle and repurpose wind turbines, something which normally goes to landfill. This project would be a welcome opportunity to create many new local jobs and for the environment, and would seem a natural fit with the longer-term plans to establish a green energy park on the wider site. Can I ask the Deputy First Minister if the Scottish Government will get behind the plans and will look to see what additional support can be offered through its agencies to get this project over the line? Deputy First Minister. Well, can I say to uh, Oliver Mundell that the Cabinet Secretary for the Wellbeing Economy will be happy to meet with him to discuss this in more detail and we'll make sure that's arranged as soon as possible. I call Paul O'Kane. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. The Greenock Telegraph reported on Monday that Greenock Police Station is likely to be closed and mothballed within a matter of months. Despite reassurances that a police presence will be maintained in the area, no alternative site for a station has been proposed. Closure of the Rue End Street station could leave K Division without adequate custody sites, meaning that officers must make hours long trips to Glasgow in order uh, to process um, people accused of crimes. Uh, and obviously, this came uh, before this morning's news. That that Police Scotland have confirmed plans to close 40 uh, buildings in the estate um, in, in the coming year. It's another demonstration of the state that this government have let the police estate fall into. So can I ask the Deputy First Minister, is she proud of the condition of the police estate, presided over by, amongst others, the current First Minister when he was just the Secretary, and will she give a guarantee that a proper police station will be provided to Inverclyde to ensure local people feel safe? Deputy First Minister. 
Well, can I say, first of all, to Paul O'Kane that, of course, uh, the police perform an essential role in keeping our communities safe, which is why, despite the difficult financial circumstances, we have increased police funding by £80 million over the, the last year to £1.45 billion for 2023-24. Of course, the issue of the Police Scotland's estate strategy is an operational decision, and they are looking at the issue of uh, properties so that they can uh, develop modern premises capable of delivering effective and efficient public services to meet the needs of people and the staff who use them. So we will continue uh, to support our Police Scotland uh, services and making sure that going forward they have an estate that is fit for purpose. And I call Beatrice Wishart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. OVO Energy prepayment customers in Shetland were unaware of the transfer of their prepayment keys from SSE to OVO and discovered their keys had stopped working earlier this month when they tried to top up at post offices. Some constituents had no electricity during a recent cold spell because they were unaware of this change. OVO say they notified customers in November, but the volume of representations I have received from constituents would suggest otherwise. Would the Deputy First Minister join with me in urging OVO to get its act together and ensure that no household is left without electricity at any time, but especially in the run-up to and over the festive season? Deputy First Minister. Well, can I say to Beatrice uh, Wisher, although energy regulation, of course, is reserved, I would join with her uh, in urging OVO uh, to get its act together, as she puts it. It does sound, uh, at the, the very least, poor customer service and people being left uh, without uh, the ability uh, to have power uh, in the, the middle of winter is not where we would want anyone to be. So I would be happy uh, to join on her, with her call for OVO uh, to get this sorted. Thank you, Deputy First Minister. That concludes First Minister's questions. There will be a short suspension uh, uh, before we move on to the next item of business to allow the public gallery to clear. And the next item of business after that will be members' business. Thank you. <laughs>